Yes, I will begin our Wednesday evening Bible study, and uh, would like to encourage everyone to sing along with uh, the first song, number 549, 549. I know the Lord will find a way for me. I know the Lord will find a way for me. If I walk in heaven's light, shun the wrong and do the right, I know the Lord will find a way for me. The Lord has said, go preach the word to all the world. The Lord has said, go preach the word to all the world. If I walk in heaven's light, shun the wrong and do the right, I know the Lord will find a way for me. Won't it be grand to hear him say, well done. Won't it be grand to hear him say, well done. If I walk in heaven's light, shun the wrong and do the right. Won't it be grand to hear him say, well done. That song sure is a beautiful thought, isn't it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you gave us such a beautiful day today. I hope we made good use of it. We're glad that we're able to come together today at the middle of the week, hear more about your word, recharge our battery, encourage one another, mostly to praise your name. Dear Heavenly Father, the things that we say and do today, we hope will be a pleasing to you and a benefit to us. We pray that uh, Mark has studied well and relays the message in a way that we can learn from it and apply it to our lives. In a few days that are remaining till we come back together again, I pray that we look for opportunities to share the word with others, bring them to know you better, encourage them to come to church and to learn more about the Bible and to have an opportunity to be saved. We know that you came to this world to save every man and every woman and every child. And we pray that we can be of use to you to try to make that happen. Heavenly Father, again, we pray for the leaders of the congregation here, for the ministers, for the uh, deacons, for the teachers, for the song leaders, for everyone involved. We pray that they'll take their responsibility seriously, make good decisions on your part. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening. Uh, it's good to see each of you here. We're going to do our overview tonight of the book of Numbers, uh, and so we'll get a little hand out there, and we'll pick up here in just a few moments. Um, so, is there any we need to uh, need? Do we send need to send a card to or make mention of tonight? So Linda Brewer's at Bethesda for rehab. Calvin. Family of Fred Brown. Yeah, that's, yeah, Jared, it was Jared's brother, Fred. Um, I also like the Cynthia. 
card to the family of Carson Cannon. Carson, my sister-in-law's father, he passed away this, this week as well. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, Griffin's having his tubes put in his ears tomorrow, so if y'all pray for him um, as well. Anyone else? Okay. Okay. Linda said that uh, they did transfer her by flight, and she's at Bethesda now. So, yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Let's go ahead, Father. Prayer. Gracious Father, we be thankful, dear Lord. Uh, for this day. Thankful for the opportunities we have. And we, Father, just to be here tonight to study your word. Lord, also for the ones we carry in our hearts and minds, we pray that be with Paris and Linda. Heavenly Father, bless them. Heavenly Father, pray little Griff surgery goes well tomorrow. Heavenly Father, ask you be with the family of Fred Brown and Carson Cannon. Dear Lord, pray that you be with them, that you bless them. Heavenly Father, during this time, may your servants be a comfort to them, dear Lord, and, your, and may they find hope in your word. Heavenly Father, help us always be mindful of the needs around us, dear Lord, and help us to be like the, the Samaritan, Heavenly Father, that was our example, dear Lord, that we just meet people where they are and bless them with what resources we have, Heavenly Father, Lord, and Heavenly Father, just even following up, dear Lord, making sure they, that they have the care, Heavenly Father, just showing kindness uh, when and where we can, Heavenly Father, uh, not to point ourselves, uh, attention toward us, dear Lord, but and point our attention toward you, Heavenly Father. May we learn, Heavenly Father, more and more each day through your Spirit, and may Heavenly Father, your Spirit, guide us uh, without any resistance on our part. We ask all this through your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to do sort of an overview of the book of Numbers. Uh, these are not meant to be a uh, verse by verse or text by text story. This is sort of getting an overview and some highlights uh, from from the from these books, uh, and um, hopefully you're you're finding it helpful. Um, and um, uh, we did Leviticus last week and, and looked at some specific things. Uh, I guess one of the endearing things that Leviticus was the law code that. And it's given once, there's parts of Numbers that has law in it, and then definitely the re-giving in Deuteronomy. And that would serve from the time it was implemented to the, after the death of Jesus, because that was the law of which the Jews lived by. Uh, and we sort of see maybe around 70 AD when the temple was destroyed, was sort of a disruption of that. But there's still people today that want to take elements from that law and apply it to, to, to believers today. Um, so that was sort of the, the, the big thing that, that we sort of talked a bit about last week. Uh, and just some practical aspects about some of the rules that they had to live by. But tonight is the book of Numbers. Uh, it's the fourth book of the Old Testament. It's attributed to, to uh, Moses. It covers between 40 and 50 years is the time span covered by the book of Numbers. Um, and, and, and so when the Hebrew Bible was... Uh, put together uh, and um, and books giving titles. Uh, it wasn't titled. It wasn't titled equivalent to, to numbers. It, it was more uh, a, a word that dealt more emphasizing the wonderings. Uh, and so, it, it when and when the when the Greek when the Greek translation was made was sort of when the book uh, uh, Arithmai came out. And that means numbers, arithmetic. You see, arithmetic, arithmetic, arithmetic was numbers. So when the Latin came out, they just translated the Greek word arithmetic uh, into the Latin phrase for numbers. And then, the, then when we get our translation, they stuck they stuck with the book of numbers. But if you look at Hebrew text, sometimes it's not called numbers. It's more like wanderings uh, or journeyings. Uh, it, it's more talking about the content of the book uh, because the book is sort of chronicling this period of time. So you say, well, how in the world did they focus on numbers then? I mean, why does that, I mean, it seems like an odd number, odd name for a book to call it numbers. 
uh, and probably numbers is not best. Numbering may be best because there are two censuses taken in the book of Numbers. Uh, one is in at Mount Sinai. It was a census of the people. Then later uh, on the plains of Moab. So, so there's two census censuses. I guess is it. I think that's plural. Censuses. It wouldn't be Sinai. Censuses. 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 It's a lot, a lot of syllables. Um, so that's why it's called numbers, basically because of the two censuses. So that, that, that's where it comes from, uh, the, the book Numbers. Um, and so um, it, they had their moments, but then more moments than not, they just didn't have the faith that, that one would believe. Now, um, there were a lot of funerals in burials during this period of time. Okay. Um, 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 Sunday night, Brother Eric gave us a really good lesson on Joshua and Caleb. They would be the only, uh, only ones of their generation to actually get to go into the promised land. So all their peers of that generation and the generations that were above a certain age when they left Egypt died in these 40 years' time. So there, there were a lot of deaths that took place, okay, during, during the, this 40 years, um, a lot of burials. Um, and so it, it, it was a tough time, to say the last, to, to not, but also God was present. You have the, 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 the pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke that led them, the cloud of smoke, the pillar of fire that led them through this period of time. Um, uh, there was, they were moving, were more than a million people moving through this area. And as they're moving, they're not moving in areas that were not uh, already claimed and populated by people. So we have these introductions of these different tribal groups, they, 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 these different people. Um, and I guess if, if anything, that, that this sort of overview has made me sort of spend time to focus and study about some of the history of who these people are. Um, so um, uh, we have the Midianites, and, and we talked about them a little bit last week. The Midianites were descendants of Abraham's son Ishmael. Ishmael had 12 sons, one of them's name was Midian. And so the Midianites were, were after Ishmael's son Midian, and they had inhabited an area in which the children of Israel passing through. Okay. Another group that we talked about a little bit last week was the Moabites. Okay. Uh, remember who Mo the Moabites were related to? Okay, Ruth. But go further back than that. Moab was one of the sons by Lot's wife, Lot's daughters, and so they they were from that union. So the Moabites were also in the land. You know. Um, and so the Moabites, the Midianites, they become interesting. They become interesting, and, and I like it. It's one of the interesting stories in the Old Testament. We'll talk about it tonight because it's it's in here. So also we have the story of the spies going to the land, you know, and 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 giving the report. Uh, it was it was impressive what they came back. You know, they said this is truly really the land flowing with milk and honey. God did not take them to frontier. You know, God, God wasn't like, you know, our folks like Daniel Boone and, and, and the, 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 the trailblazers that established this country. They didn't have to carve out a life in the wilderness. They were, they were taken through lands that already had cultivation and probably irrigation and, and groves and vineyards and houses and walled cities. And God was going to drop out the inhabitants to let them come in. You know, they weren't starting from scratch. Uh, they were starting with well-established places, you know, and, and so the tribal lands that, that were there, people were going to be displaced, and that becomes part of the issue with Balak. He becomes a central character uh, toward chapter 22, 23 in the book that he, he, does, he, he, he sort of sees the handwriting on the wall, so to speak, uh, and he doesn't like it, and so he, he, wants, he wants to stop this if, if, if he can. Um, so th they didn't think they could inherit the land. It grieved God. God says, okay, 
If you don't think you can do it with me, then you're going to have to suffer the consequences of it. Um, and so that was that was part of part of the consequences that they had. Um, and um, I mentioned earlier, beginning you know uh, in chapter. Um, uh, 20, uh, 28, God begins laying out uh, some commands for offerings. Uh, and 28, 29, 30, uh, we, we have, uh, and, and through several of the chapters, we have these things that are laid out. Um, and, um, and and so there's some interesting things in there um, re regarding relationships. Chapter 30 does a lot with oaths and, and promises. Um, and um, and back then, marriages were not necessarily for romantic reasons. They were more for um, Material reasons very often it was securing land securing property, you know people didn't necessarily marry, marry for romantic reasons So there was a lot of uh, in chapter 30 a lot of things about uh, how, how you can get out of a vow You know how you make a vow and so forth um, But you have to have witnesses. We still sort of practice that today Witnesses and wedding ceremonies if there's not a witness the vow is void So it just has it's his word against hers so, uh, which is different than, you know, um, than what would have been maybe custom. <laughs> because at this point in time, women didn't have a lot of rights. Um, in fact, women were sort of itemized and considered not cattle, but chattel, the property of the husband. Uh, so that would have been the, the sort of the, the cultural practices around them. But what's interesting, the law of God gives a lot of rights to women. Uh, even this old law, which we seem sort of old and, and barbaric, 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 and, and our, from our perspective, still elevates women to give them certain rights that they probably would not have possessed um, to those around them. Um, and so um, you have this Eleazar, a priest, uh, that sort of pops up in the book of Moses. Um, and so there's tributes paying to him um, and uh, uh, in, in chapter 30 and 31 um, and, and a lot of descriptions and numbers about the journeys and they departed here and kept here they'd moved here and hit this so you look at chapter 3 it's almost like a travel journal it's like someone kept a journal we, we, we stayed here we kept here then we moved here and then we kept here and we moved here yes Calvin <laughs> the women weren't counting the census. It's well over a million people. There, it's well over a million people. It's a lot of people, and they didn't they didn't move around unnoticed. No, in the desert. In the desert. Well, yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. A large, large group. Yep. Um, if you if you if you look at where look on a look on a globe and look at the equator and trace your finger down to where Israel is on the equator and just just keep moving your finger around Israel and just come over to North America and you're going to find that that South Georgia and North Florida is geographically pretty close from the equator as Israel is. So you don't think of those as being 
desert places, okay, necessarily. So a lot of the same vegetation, the same kind of things that grow here, grow there. Now there are, when you go to the lower elevations, you go like to the Dead Sea, which is one of the lowest points on Earth, it is desert, okay? But you go like to the Plain of Sharon, the Plain of Sharon, it's, it's an oasis. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's beautiful. I mean, it's not an oasis as in sand. And, I mean, it's like fertile. It, it, it's a fertile area, you know. Uh, but there, just think, too, about the mountainous areas, you know. Uh, you've, got, you've, got, you've got a lot of mount, different mountains and stuff like that. Like from Mount Carmel, you can see from Mount Carmel, you can look over and see, you know, the, the Plain of Sharon. I mean, but, you know, dates, figs, grapes, you know, all these things, which grow there, you know. Uh, also grow in South Georgia, North Florida as well, but you can also have cold weather at the higher elevations. You know, there's, there's mention of snow in Proverbs 31. You know, talks about the the virtuous woman. Her, you know, her, her you know, her house is, you know, uh, you know, not not afraid of the weather. You know, that though your sins be as scarlet, they should be as white as snow. And they'll be red like crimson. They should be as wool. You know, so there's references to those things. So sort of think of sort of that area. Um, and what we call a redbud tree, they call a Judas tree. Uh, it's it, it's basically the same tree. You know, they call it Judas tree because it blooms in blood. We call it redbud because it blooms red buds. Uh, it's also heart. We have heart shaped leaf. And according to their legend, that the Judas tree will never grow big enough again for a man to hang himself from. Well, I planted redbud trees. You know, and they all died after a few years. They got a little bit size, and they all died. You know, is there some kind of thing that kills them? So, uh, uh, so, but, but not without casting millions of seeds everywhere and have redbud seedlings coming up all the time. So, so there's there's that. So they're moving through some very fertile land, and God says, just keep moving, just keep moving. You know, you eventually possess this, but not now. Just keep moving. And that was what was so unnerving to people like Balak for thinking, you know. They're going to dispossess me. They're going to they're going to run me out, you know. So Balak tries to get a priest to curse them, uh, and so and by cursing them was to prevent them from you know from being able to be prosperous and settling and stuff. So that's also found in the book of, of, of Numbers, um, chapter nineteen uh, is sort of an interesting thing, uh, and where it f- falls into the current. Contemporary perspective. There are a group of very conservative Orthodox Jews who believe the Messiah cannot come until the temple is the temple mount is reclaimed, rededicated, and the sacrificial system starts again. So they believe that the only way the Messiah will ever come is that if the Temple Mount is reclaimed, currently the Temple Mount is under possession of, of Islam. It's the third most holy site of Islam. That's where they say that, that Muhammad ascended you know, from, from, from the Temple Mount. So it's their third most holy site. Okay, so if you go to Israel, you have, uh, you have the, 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 the Wailing Wall you know, down here. Okay. But above that elevation there, behind on the higher behind the wedding wall, the wedding wall is just a retaining wall, basically, dating back to the first temple period, maybe, um, probably second temple, but anyways. But the higher elevation is where the Allah Akbar Mosque is, uh, and then the Dome of the Rock. Uh, and that's where the Muslims meet to pray, and then that's that's where they believe Muhammad ascended there. Now that's the traditional side of where the temple was. And so, and that, if you look at pictures, if you go on Google Earth, you look at the Temple Mount today, you see this gold dome there, <clears throat> that building with a gold dome. And that's not a mosque. They don't go necessarily in there to pray. The mosque is over to the right of that, I guess, depending on which direction you're looking, but on the right of that. But that is the traditional place where the temple stood. Now, um, when, when, when I was in there a few years ago, uh, it's over years ago now, uh, we were walking around, there's a cave under the rock. There's the rock, the rock surface is exposed. There's some steps go down to a little grotto, a little cave under the rock. Um, and um, we were walking around in there 
Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Moss, one of the professors, says, you know where you're standing right now? And I said, you know, no. He said, you're probably standing in the most holy of holies. And my, you know, the skin, <laughs> the hairs went up in my arm, arms and the back of my neck, you know, because, you know, that's where you died, you know, if you weren't, if you weren't prepared. He said, you're probably standing in the most holy of holies right now. Um, and so, uh, but if you can see an aerial view of the rock, there is actually a rectangular carved indention in the rock. And scholars believe that's where the, that is actually where the Ark of the Covenant sat. It's about the dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant. And they believe that's where the Ark of the Covenant sat. So, um, so it's, it's a very interesting site. So all that said, okay, chapter 19. <laughs> this is really interesting. Uh, now, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, this is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, speak to the children of Israel, that they bring you a red heifer without blemish in which there is no defect and on which has a yoke has never been. Uh, and you should give to Eleazar the priest and take it outside the camp and it should be slaughtered beforehand. And Eleazar the priest shall take some of its blood with his fingers and sprinkle some of the blood seven times directly in front of the tabernacle meeting. Then the red heifer shall be burned in his sight, its hide, its flesh, and its blood, and its offal shall be burned. And that's simply the guts uh, which shall be burned. Um, and then, then the purification process from the red heifer. So how that fits in contemporary times, that group of very zealous, very determined Jewish people who want to reestablish the sacrificial system, reclaim the, the, reclaim the Temple Mount, start it all over again, the, they say the only thing preventing them from doing that is finding a perfect red heifer. Okay, and, and a few years ago, it actually came out in the international news, they were so excited a red heifer had been born. And they thought, okay, this is the sign, this is the sign. But in per further investigation, she had some white hairs. And so she got this close. And so, but I also found there are people who support if, if Israel in the United States that are helping them with the red heifer project. So they're, they're trying to find a red heifer who has no blemish, Never been under and has, I mean, it can't have a single off color hair on its body. And they believe once they have that red heifer, then they can sacrifice it, they can reclaim the temple, sacrifice it, and reimplement the sacrificial system. Now, as has been pointed out, if they attempt to do that, that will probably start World War III uh, because the Muslims claim that is the third most holy side of the religion. So in all likelihood, that, that is, it's not probably going to happen. Uh, when we were in Israel, Ami, our guide went everywhere with us except for two or three places. And so he, he ushered us to, to, the base of the, to, the, to the base of the Temple Mount, and he wouldn't go any further. You know, but every place else, he always went with us. Uh, and later we found out, you know, why didn't Ami go with us? And they said, well, he's pretty funny about some of his beliefs, you know, uh, that you know, he's, he's Jewish. Uh, even uh, uh, our, uh, our, our bus driver, they had a weird relationship. He was Palestinian, but he was but, uh, our, our thing. But he also said that if he went up there, he'd have to give up his, his arms because he, 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 we never went anywhere without him carrying a gun. And so, and so because, it was, is, it, because it's Islamic control, he'd have to relinquish his pistol and he would not relinquish his pistol to escort us up there because he didn't go anywhere that with his pistol. So, uh, so that, was, that was that experience. So that's sort of interesting, a little aside, maybe that. So questions or comments before we get into this next? Okay. I, I referenced it earlier. So in chapter 20, Oh, chapter 20 also covers Miriam's death. Miriam's Moses' sister. She dies in chapter 20. Uh, and so, um, so we have Moses going through Edom, chapter 21. And then in chapter 22, they're on the plains of Moab. So they, they've moved through, you know, Edom. You know, and so Edom's were, Edomites were who? Esau's descendants. So Edom simply means red. So 
in Hebrew it's red, so they, they were they were Edomites were Esau uh, Esau's descendants. The Moabites were Esau's. Uh, I mean, the Edomites were Esau's descendants. So, so chapter twenty-two, they come to Moab, and so Moab's the descendants of Lot. Um, there is uh, Balak's son of Zippor, um, and so he saw that the, that they had been they had sort of been successful over the Amorites. Um, and they, they had begun to possess these cities. Um, and so, um, so he's concerned. Uh-oh, I'm next. Um, Zippor is an interesting thing. Um, Balak shows up in the New Testament. He's referenced in the New Testament as well. Okay. He's referenced again uh, in, in, in the Old Testament. Um, Zippor could be his father. Uh, but it's also been suggested it may have been one of the, the idols that he used, that he was so dedicated to this bird idol, uh, Zippor, archaeologists sort of suggest that maybe that was sort of his identity, and it was a sort of this, this, this idol that they used. Um, so, um, so he says, you know, I, you know I'm sick. Uh, you know, in verse 3, he says, sick with dread, you know. So he calls to the elders of the Midian. So he calls his neighbor, the Midianites, and says, hey, listen, they're going to eat us out of house and home, pretty much. Um, and he says, they will look up everything around us, you know. Uh, and uh, he says, they're going to pretty much eat us out of house and home. Um, and so he sends messengers to Balaam, uh, the son of Beor, and, and says, listen, um, these people come from Egypt. We got to do something about them. Uh, and he says, "I want you to come up and I want you to curse them. I want you just to curse them." Okay. Uh, so, which is interesting um, that that you know that, that he calls him up to do this. You know that he, he wants them uh, to to curse these people. Uh, and so, uh, so the elders of Moab, elders of Median, you know, you know that they pay him a fee. You know, he's sort of a, a hired hand cursor, I guess. You know, you know whoever pays him, he'll curse you for the highest fee or whatever. So, um, so they say, okay, you know, go, go look. You know, uh, they're going to cover the face of the earth again. Here's Calvin's point. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. You know? uh, and uh, so he went in the morning uh, and uh, he says, listen, you know, uh, God told me not to do it. Um, and so they went and said, hey, he doesn't want to go with us. Uh, and so he sends even more of a big delegation of people, um, and uh, and he says, "Listen, you know, just just whatever it takes, you know, pay him off." And pretty much they attempt to do that. Uh, and then uh, Balaam said, "You know, to the servants of Balak, though he gives me a house full of silver and gold, I would not go beyond the word of the Lord uh, to do more or less." And he says, "Okay, please uh, stay here tonight and let me know what the Lord says to you." Uh, and then God tells Balaam, if the men come to you, verse 20, to call on you, rise and go with them, but only speak the words what I speak to you that you shall do. And so Balaam gets up the next morning, saddles his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. And so God gets angry at him. Verse 22. Because he went with the, the, the princes of Moab, so God gets angry at him. So here's this prophet riding on his donkey. And so God sends an angel to stand in his way. He's riding on his donkey. He's got two servants with him. Now the donkey, now this is a, this is a really, really an interesting story. The prophet of God cannot see the angel in the road, but the donkey can. Okay. Now, I'm sorry if you've never seen the, the, the kids maybe Shrek. You know, it's forever ruined me with the story of Balak because Eddie Murphy's now the donkey. Okay. <laughs> the, the donkey now has the voice of Eddie Murphy. Okay. Uh, from, from the movie Shrek Donkey. So uh, so now in my my hearing he's got his, he's got that, that voice and stuff. So the donkey balks 
And so Balaam struck the donkey uh, to get her back on the road. The, you know, the donkey says, hey, there's, you know, it's not. So the angel of the Lord stood in the narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on the side and a wall on that side. And so now, you know, it's in a narrow path between the vineyard. There's, it, it, there's two walls. The vineyard very often protected because they have simply great value in there. And so the donkey tries to push herself against the wall to crush the prophet to make him get off. And then uh, the donkey actually laid down under Balaam. So the donkey just lays down. And then verse 27, he begins to strike the donkey with his staff. And this is the interesting part. The Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and said to Balaam, what have, I had, what have I done to you that you struck me these three times? And so <laughs> what's interesting, <laughs> Balaam has a conversation with a donkey. He's like, whoa, there's a donkey talking here. <laughs> you know, uh, he has a conversation with a donkey, you know. So I'm going to date myself. When I was growing up, Mr. Ed, the talking horse, was a TV show. I was the only fan person in my family who liked the show, so I didn't get to watch it very much. There's probably a lot of back episodes of Mr. Ed the talking the talking horse. So, but but he has a conversation with a donkey. Okay, then Balaam said to the donkey, "Because you abused me, I wish there were a sword in my hand. Now that I would kill you." So the donkey said to Balaam, "Am I not your donkey, which you've ridden ever since I became yours to this day?" Was I ever disposed to you to do this? And he said, no. The donkey says, I've always been a good donkey. Ever since you've owned me, I've been a good donkey. You know, why would you want to kill me? Have I ever done anything like this before? You know, so he's having this <laughs> debate with a donkey. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel Lord standing in this way with his hand, drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Because I have come out to stand against you, because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she would not turned aside from me, surely I would have also killed you by now and let her live. And Balaam said to the angel Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now therefore, if it displeased you, I will turn back. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with these men, but only speak the word that I, that I speak to you. I shall speak to you. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. So instead of going to Moab, he goes back, goes back to the princes of Balak, and basically he comes back and says, He wouldn't curse them. Balak is really angry. He wouldn't curse them. Um, and so, uh, so what he decides, okay, if we can't curse them, he conspires with Moab to say, let's get all the pretty women, pretty much, and let's have them seduce the men of Israel. And that's what they did. So if we can't beat them, let, them, let, us, let them join us. And so there are prohibitions against lineage and stuff for those for those half half breed children. Uh, you know, they're, they're they're half tribe; they're not full. So there's all these things against them. So, what's the moral of the story of Balak? Where's the application for us today in Balaam and his donkey? I have a, a little, I have actually two things I have to think about. I have a little pure donkey on my desk at my counseling office. Somewhere else I got another donkey, a little trophy of a donkey. Someone gave me one time. I, I think there's application in it for us today as followers of Jesus. There are a group of people who think they're so special that only God can use them. They're so gifted, so talented, so smart, so wonderful that only God can use them. And to those people I say, remember, 
God used Balaam's donkey. So, so, so don't think yourself so, so unique and so special that, that God used Balaam's donkey. Then there's a group of people who believe they're so ill-equipped, so humble, so, so you know, ungifted, maybe so broken. They also remember God used Balaam's donkey too. That, 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 that there's none of us that God can't use. And they're never so special that we need that to, to over estimate our worth either that, that, that God used Balaam's donkey so um, number 23 19 is a very important verse God is not human that he should lie not human being that he should change his mind does he speak and then not act does he promise and not fulfill so that's a messianic promise eventually if God says, I'm going to bless you through Abraham, God never gave up on his promise. So everything points to Jesus. You know, just because he wasn't answering in their 40 year of wonderings the way they wanted him to, God doesn't lie. And then Numbers 14, 32 through 33. But as for you, your bodies will fall in this wilderness. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness. And the last your bodies lie in the wilderness. So that was the consequence of the people's in, 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 in unwillingness to in, inhabit the land and, and possess the land that God had promised them because of their fear that there might be giants. There's a great passage in, in, uh, in Joshua. Uh, I love it. They, they, had, they had driven out the nations. They had dispossessed the people. And it came down to Caleb's time. And his area was mountainous and rough and inhabited with a lot of the really tough people had gone up into the mountains. Uh, and Joshua was saying, Caleb, I'm sorry, you know, you know <laughs> all the bad guys are on your land now. Okay. Uh, they're up in those hills, you know, they had the advantage, uh, you know, sort of sorry, you know, sort of almost like, you know, you may not get your, your, your promise. And you remember what Caleb says? I'm 80 years old. I'm 80 years old. Give me this mountain. I'm as strong as the day I left Israel. I mean, I left Egypt. Give me this mountain. So he says, you know, I'm 80 years old. I'm ready for it. I'm itching for a fight. You know? So there is a there is an, a site on that area, which today they said that's the house. You know, you go up there, they said that's the house, that's Caleb's house. You know, that people, you know, there's been a long standing tradition that, that, you know, his house was established there in those mountains, uh, and uh, he's there. So any points or questions? Okay, so uh, we will we will go into uh, Deuteronomy uh, next week, uh, and so uh, it in itself is a is an interesting interesting book.
383 will be our song of encouragement in just a moment. 383. I want you to use your, your thinking caps here for a minute with a few of these questions I'm going to ask. Um, and it won't offend me at all if you even answer it out loud, if you can figure it out. First one, if you look at the numbers on my face, you won't find 13 any place. What am I? Clock. Tear one off and scratch my head. Well, it's once, what once was red is black instead. What am I? A what? No. A match. A match. That's right. The eight of us go back and fo- go forward. Excuse me. Let me re- forget that. Real reread that. The eight of us go forth, not back, to protect our king from a foe's attack. What am I? Hans. So this one is tricky if you don't have it written down. I'm just going to give you a heads up on that. We're five little items of an everyday sort. You'll find us all in a tennis court. What am I? We're five little items of an everyday sort. You'll find us all in a tennis court. I told you this one's hard if you don't have it written down. If you write down these three words, a tennis court. The answer is there. Fouls. A-E-I-O-U. So, last one here. This is the most important one. Once it is gone, you can't reclaim it. You can spend it, but can't regain it. What am I? Time. Time. The other I get, I understand how important time really is. Um... Being younger, um, I thought that money was one of the most important things. I gotta have more, I gotta have more, I gotta have more. And when you go out and you buy something, you kind of feel that guilt sometimes when you buy it. But then after, you know, a week or two or a month or seven years later, um, you kind of, once you get that paid off and you get that built back up, you kind of forget about that because you can, you can always find a way uh, to gain more money or um, to put more back into your account or, or whatever the case may be. But I'm reminded every day at work because I hear this all the time. A caller calls in multiple times a day. They get someone on the line that is either new or not really doing the best ability at their job. And then they get thrown to me, and they're mad, and they're fuming. And I've been on the phone for two hours with this person before you. Don't y'all understand that I've got more important things to do with my day, you know, than spend two hours now talking to the bank and all this. And, you know, hey, more times than not, I can get them on and off the phone in less than ten minutes. And I have to ask this question on every call. Is there anything else I can do for you today? And they'll say, yes. Um, what are you going to do to reimburse me for my time? Because I can't get that two hours back. So what are you going to do about it? Time's extremely valuable. We, when we're younger, one, we don't see the value of time. But also, we see time as never-ending. Never-ending. My daughters, every day, I want to be a grown-up. And I look at them, and my first response every day is, said no grown-up ever. Uh, <laughs> I want to be you. You've got it made, and you don't even realize it. And, my, and then my second response is always, listen, don't rush away time. Don't rush away time. Because you can't get that time back. It's extremely valuable. What we do with our time is extremely valuable. There's 168 hours in a week. Three... Four of those hours, for many, are spent in a room similar to this that we refer to as going to church. Four hours of that, depending on where you go, anywhere it could be from two to four hours a week. Unless Jeff is long-winded, then it might be four and a half hours. (laughs) That still leaves roughly... 164 hours in a week. 
My wife will tell you I've become a stickler on time and how I use my time. And if I've got a bunch of things scheduled in a day, um, if something throws a wrench into that schedule because I have things in my mind mapped out and allotted and this much time for this and this should take this and I can get there in 45 minutes and do this. And when something throws a wrench in my day, it really throws me for a loop because how am I going to fit that in with this limited amount of time? That's not infinite. But then when I really sit back and I think about it, what am I doing with my time? Is it beneficial? Is it worthwhile? Is it something that is beneficial to my family? Is it something that's beneficial to my mental health, to my physical health? Is it something that's beneficial more than anything to the church? What am I doing with my time? When we think of arrogance, we think of people that are so puffed up and consumed with themselves that they're arrogant. But the honest truth is there's more arrogant people in this world than may be humble. And I'm not talking about the people that think of themselves as higher than others. James chapter 4 talks about our time. And James says, Come now you who say today or tomorrow we'll go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow's going to bring. What's your life? You're a vapor, you're a mist that appears for a little time and then it vanishes. Instead you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. When we have this mentality of, well, I've got tomorrow for this. I've got tomorrow to take care of that. There's always tomorrow. James says that's the very definition of arrogance. This idea that, that I'm guaranteed tomorrow. This idea that I've got tomorrow in the bag. And the fact of the matter is, he says, your life is a vapor. It's here one minute and the next minute it's gone. And you're not even guaranteed tomorrow. So maybe you need to start saying today. I'm the world's worst of putting things off that need to be done until tomorrow. Put a lot of things off that need to be taken care of in the moment or need to be taken care of in that very day. And I say, you know what, I'll get to it tomorrow. Tell you a quick story. This is not meant to scare you. This is not meant to scare anyone into anything. I don't intend it to do that, but I do think it shows some severity in our thinking. It's very rare for me to sleep. Sleeping in for me is six o'clock. That's the latest. It's very rare for me to sleep any time past that. Primarily because my youth ministry days are over. I think lock-ins are sinful, and I like my sleep. I'm going to go home after this. I'm going to go to bed. I'll just be honest with you. I slept till 7 o'clock one morning, and I got, a, I got woken up by a phone call. And I answered the phone, and they, and, and they said, where are you at? And I said, well, I'm still at the house. I didn't have to be into the office till 8. So, I mean, I wasn't, like, panicking, thinking, oh, I'm running late. Where are you at? I'm at the house. Get to the church. Okay, why? There's somebody here wanting to be baptized. Pretty sure there's, like, eight guys there. Why do you need me, first of all, is what I was thinking. I didn't want to get fired at the time, so I didn't say that. Uh, but I was thinking that. Well, you know, there's eight guys there. Why are y'all waiting for me? What are y'all doing? Like, if, they, if this guy's ready, do it. Who cares who does it? Get to the church. Okay, I get to the church, and this guy, he's pacing. He's pacing the aisle of the building, just waiting. And I get there, and uh, we end up baptizing him. He's in his mid to late 70s. We end up baptizing him. Before we baptized him, his daughter said, you know, he was up all night. He couldn't sleep. He was pacing circles around his bed. He hadn't slept a wink all night. We baptized the guy. The guy walks into the baptistry on his own, goes down into the water, comes up from the water, walks out of the baptistry unassisted, no hands on him, gets to the bottom of the steps and sits down, puts his head in his hands. Thinking he's just emotional, right? It's an emotional time. Let him get that out. Let him, you know, let that soak in. So he sits there for about 10 minutes. His brother-in-law gets up, who had no business trying to get him up because his brother-in-law could barely walk himself. But he, he goes, okay, it's time to get up. You know, and he goes to get him up. And when he goes to get him up, the guy falls back into the wall and begins to fall towards me, catch him, 
bring him down, and I look. If you've ever heard the saying, you see the lights go out? I see the lights go out. Eyes begin to roll back. Foam begins to come out of the mouth. CPR starts immediately. Ambulance is there, taken to the hospital. They officially pronounced him as, as dead at the hospital. That man died in my arms. I've been around it. I've seen it. He was gone in my arms. The reason why I say that is, is I think about it and I'm like, man, what if I was only, what if I was, got stuck in traffic and they were waiting on me for another 45 minutes? What if I got into a wreck and they were waiting on me for another 45 minutes? You see, as much as it's a sad story for some, it's actually a beautiful story. Because I think that was the perfect, beautiful illustration of God is not willing that any should perish, but he's patient, he's long-suffering, that all should come to repentance. And I believe those that are seeking and those that are looking for the way and those that are, are seeking to obey that way, I believe God provides them that opportunity to do so. But it really taught me a valuable lesson and kind of shocked me a little bit about the importance of time. Because it's not guaranteed. So how are you using your time? How are you using your time? I can't answer that for you. I can only answer that for me. And if you're anything like me, so many times I think, man, I waste a lot of time on things that do not matter. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, I don't know your spiritual state. I don't know if you need to obey the gospel tonight. But if you do so and you believe that you're ready and you know that what Jesus did for you and you know that you're ready, you don't have to know everything, but you know that you're ready to commit your life to him and you're ready to strive to live for him and begin that growth process as a newborn babe in Christ. We want to assist you with that. We want to take the time to do that because that is the most important thing we could do with our time right now. If you are a Christian and you're struggling, you need strength to get through this life, we want to stop. We want to pray because that, too, is the most important thing that we could do with our time right now. If you have a spiritual need, please come while we stand and while we sing. <clears throat> have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will while I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me master today whiter than snow lord wash me just now as in thy presence humbly i bow have thine own way Good to see you out tonight and hope to see you uh, Sunday morning and hope you have a blessed rest of the week. Number 280, we'll sing as our closing song. 280, we'll sing the first verse of that. Sweetly, Lord, we have heard thee calling. Come, follow me. And we seek 
where thy footprints falling lead us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where ere they go. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us the privilege to be here tonight and to hear your word taught, Father, and to just get to know you more, Father. Each time we open your word, Father, that enables us to know you better and know what an awesome and, and great God you are, Father. Your grace and mercy that you give us and, and the Savior Jesus Christ that came here to earth to, to give us the pathway back to you. Father, we pray that you bless us as we leave this place and Keep us in your arms, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.